the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. Scandal in the Orthodox community includes violence, the Tony Awards' most Jewish moments, turning back the clock on Jewish theater, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. The Orthodox Jewish community is making a lot of news these days, and most of it isn't good. How would you feel if your Jewish identity were represented as a blank spot on a government-issued ID? That's what Reform and Conservative converts are wondering, as a new regulation in Israel is mandating listing nationality on identification cards. Those born Jewish or those who converted through Orthodox rabbis will have their cards list Judaism as their nationality, but those who converted to Judaism through Reform or Conservative rabbis will have their nationality left blank. The regulation comes from Israel's interior minister, Eli Yishai, who is a member of the Orthodox Shas party. Going from an example of wanting to be listed on a document as Jewish, what if you couldn't get a valid Jewish divorce document? That's the situation faced by a number of Orthodox Jewish women whose husbands refuse to give them a get, the formal recognition of Jewish divorce, even when they already have a divorce with the state. This week, the woman stuck in such a marriage the longest is no longer an aguna or chained woman, after almost 50 years. Susan Zinkin received a divorce in Britain's courts in 1962 when she was still in her 20s. But her husband did not give her a Jewish divorce in 1962 or at any time thereafter. It was only when he died last week that she became eligible to marry another man under Orthodox Jewish law. She is now 73 and a retired teacher. But while it's hard for many Orthodox Jewish women to get divorced due to religious sanctions, Orthodox Jewish groups are also stepping up this week to try to prevent some couples from getting married. A series of Orthodox groups, ranging from the Orthodox Union to Agudath Israel and many in between, are fighting the push to recognize same-sex marriage in New York State. For many of these organizations, there's a practical effort to be able to continue their hiring and firing practices without facing discrimination lawsuits. But for some in the Orthodox world, there's also a desire simply to keep same-sex marriages from occurring at all. In a statement signed by prominent rabbis, including Shmuel Kamenetsky of Philadelphia, Orthodox Jewish leaders called for a fast day to keep the legislation from passing. The statement, brought to light by the blog Dove Bear, declared that same-sex marriage legislation is a fearful abomination and a great danger to Jewish souls. Elsewhere in the ultra-Orthodox world, claims about sectarian violence are stirring up the local authorities. A man was firebombed in the ultra-Orthodox dominated town of New Square recently, allegedly by the personal secretary of the Grand Rebbe of the local Hasidic sect. The claimed motivation of the alleged ultra-Orthodox firebomber is that the victim of the firebombing was choosing to attend a different Orthodox synagogue. The victim sustained burns over half of his body and remains in hospital care. And where spokespeople for the community told reporters that the alleged arsonist had not returned to the community's yeshiva, this footage from News 12 shows the young man back in learning with his fellow students. Moving on, an episode of Tolerance for Diverse Jewish Expression comes out of Texas this week. It's now state law there that homeowner associations must allow residents to display religious symbols on their doors, which would include the traditional Jewish mezuzah on doorposts. A conservative Jewish couple was behind the new law when they were ordered to remove a mezuzah from the front door of their rental apartment and were fined when they refused. But when it comes to public religious displays, one place that doesn't often come to mind is the local zoo. But a recent event at Central Park Zoo saw all in attendance enjoying the Jewish Sabbath, as Christian Neiden reports. The future of the Jewish National Fund gathered this past Friday evening for a high-profile dining event to mark the beginning of the Sabbath. And despite heavy rains in the early going, scores of JNF future members and donors turned out for the annual Shabbat in the Park at the Central Park Zoo. JNF Future Chair Andy Ashwall said that the event, now in its fourth year, has grown with his organization's fundraising clout. Shabbat in the Park is really our highlighted gala event. It ends off our campaign year. It's really a chance for us to figure out if we've met all of our fundraising goals, something that people look forward to year after year. We have 360 people here this year. I wish we could have 500. I wish we could expand the tent and go all over the zoo. I think we would really sell out. And those lucky enough to get in this year had plenty of attractions to check out, starting with the Central Sea Lion exhibit, where trainers used the daily feeding time to let their charges show off their stuff. Attendees also had access to the Jungle House, with its vast array of exotic birds, rodents, monkeys, and other rare captive species. 
Yet it might be the Penguin House that best symbolizes JNF Future's recent efforts at building comfortable homes in even the most inhospitable of places. For just as these birds relish a swim in their man-made Arctic waters, JNF members trumpeted their environmental acumen in transforming the Negev Desert into the site of Israel's next housing boom. At JNF, we do three things very well. One, environmental development. A quarter of a billion trees, 34 billion gallons of water. Two, environmental research and development. Pioneers in drip irrigation and a lot of other stuff. They're literally pulling carrots out of the Negev Desert right now. Three, sustainable community development. The Negev is 60% of Israel and the JNF is the leader in developing that land. Really, New York City is focused on Blueprint Negev as well as Beersheba. And what we're doing in Beersheba is we're taking an old brownfield, like a brownfield redevelopment, and we're taking, we've gotten rid of all of the grossness, and we've created in this wadi a beautiful river walk. There's areas for people to walk through, there's a park, there's playgrounds, there's green area, there's now water flowing through what used to be a place where uh, cars and a junkyard used to be. To see more from the JNF Future Shabbat in the Park event, including how it raised money for a fire-ravaged city in Israel, and what this Hot 97 radio DJ had to say about the organization and its fundraising efforts, please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. A very different kind of regular celebration is the annual Tony Awards for Broadway Theater. And you'll be surprised by just how Jewish the lineup this year was, as Meredith Gansman found out. Jewish fascination with Broadway was highlighted at this year's Tony Awards, right from the opening performance featuring host Neil Patrick Harris. For gays, the gays and the Jews, and cousins in from out of town you have to amuse, and the sad embittered malcontents who write the reviews, and also foreign tourists and the groups of senior citizens and well-to-do suburbanites and liberal intellectuals, though that group is really only Jews and homosexuals. I've lost my train of thought, oh yes, it's not just for gays anymore. It's Broadway's biggest night at the 65th Annual Tony Awards, and I'm coming to you from the red carpet with all of the nominees, presenters, performers, and, well, all things Jewish about the 2011 Broadway season. The David Letterman show's Paul Schaefer took a night off to come to the Tonys and instantly connected with TJC. Ah, someone who cares. <laughs> oh, no wonder I see the mug and dove, and no wonder you care. Yes. Well, Talking about how it feels to be at Broadway's biggest night. It's terrific, isn't it? I, I brought my daughter Victoria, a, a, a wonderful catch for some Jewish guy out there, and I uh, see it's a Jewish television. Uh, there's some nice Jewish boys here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think we may be able to find some. And uh, I get to be in a number tonight. The the, uh, the show Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, uses its raining men to open their show, and I was one of the writers of that. So tonight we're gonna, I'm going to do it with them and Martha Wash from the Weather Girls. The Book of Mormon, the irreverent musical comedy about faith and religion, was nominated for 14 awards. And legendary Jewish actress Tova Felcha said she connected with the Book of Mormon on a Jewish level. I think a lot what they say applies to all religions that take up the mantle of fundamentalism. Yes. I am not a fundamentalist, and that goes for our religion as well. I believe. One number from the show, performed at the Tonys, offers a satirical take on what it means to be a Mormon. For my sins, and I believe that ancient Jews built boats and sailed to America. I am a Mormon. And the nominee for Best Actor in a Musical from the Book of Mormon, Josh Gad, says he brings his Jewish background to the role. How does it feel to be a nice Jewish boy playing a Mormon on Broadway? It's great. It's great. Every night I walk out there, I think the audience goes, huh? How did, how did he become a Mormon? Uh, which is the point. So, you know, we're, it's, it's all fun. It's all a blast. For more from this year's Very Jewish Tony Awards, tune in to the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, the Jewish theater of old was the theme at a massive celebration earlier this week, and Rebecca Honig Friedman stopped by. At the Catskills Musical Memories concert this week, Emmy-winning actor Fivish Finkel reminisced about the good old days. The Catskill Mountains, I remember when I was 17 years old. That's when I started there. 
the nostalgia-filled evening of Borscht Belt-style entertainment, featured Finkel as comedic MC and headliner Joanne Engel, backed by the Howard LeShaw Klezmer Orchestra. The event was held at the Sutton Place Synagogue, where Finkel said he's been a member for 35 years. It's so wonderful to be a member here, and now I'm 88 years old. That's, a, no, that's all right. With this audience, it's no big deal. While the sold-out crowd of 600 did include a smattering of younger folk, the majority of attendees were older adults who had fond memories of spending summers in the Jewish Alps, as the Catskills were called, in their Jewish heyday. This appreciative audience member, who spent two summers working as a busboy at the Kutcher's Hotel, explained what made those summers so special. It was uniquely Jewish, and the entertainment was great. It was just a wonderful experience being there, working there, and I miss it. Corey Breyer also misses it. He is president of event sponsor the Yiddish Artists and Friends Actors Club, a social organization that started in 1936 when the Catskills was just taking shape as an affordable vacation spot for Eastern European immigrants. In the 30s, 40s, especially in the 50s and 60s, when I was growing up, it was just an unbelievable place to be. Everybody was Jewish. Everybody spoke Yiddish or knew Yiddish. The Forwards was the newspaper that was read in the hotels, and the entertainment reflected that at night where many of the Yiddish uh, theater stars performed. And for some poor, hard-working immigrants, a Catskills vacation was an opportunity to escape from more than just the heat, as Fivish Finkel recalled after the show. Out there, it's a funny thing. As soon as they passed the, the borderline, everybody lived a different life. If a man worked in a shop, when he passed that borderline, he told everybody in the hotel, I own that shop. But as the Jewish community evolved, so did the Catskills nightlife. And the audiences changed and they became younger and more Americanized. Uh, the, uh, or the entertainment changed and performers like Joanne Engel, who was our star this evening, became the stars up there. But they always remembered to sing a little Yiddish and Hebrew to remember the roots, where we all came from. Joanne Engel was only 15 when she started entertaining in the Catskills in the 1960s. It was great. There were 500 hotels, a numerous amount of bungalow colonies, what we called kachalanes at that time. And joints were jumping. It was amazing. It was an amazing place to be. It was a tremendous era. For more of the Catskills Musical Memories concert, tune in to the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Rebecca. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. IO Optimum Cable Channel 291, Time Warner Cable Channel 528, RCN Channel 268, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and Cox Cable Channel 1. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.